Good. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Ivan Koichev. I'm a, uh, a, a clinical researcher at Oxford. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our first in-person uh, Great Minds event. Um, for those of you that not, don't know, Great Minds is a research register for people who are uh, willing to, to, to volunteer for, for brain health research. Uh, and it's organized by Dementia's Platform UK, which is a, a medical research council funded study. Um, we have a fantastic uh, uh, selection of talks for you today. Unfortunately, two of the speakers have come down ill. Uh, it's such, such, is, such is the situation these days, but we've managed to replace one of them. Uh, and then perhaps we'll have an extended Q&A with the four speakers that uh, we do have. Um, a couple of housekeeping um, uh, just things that I need to mention. We don't have a fire, a fire alarm planned. There's uh, fire exits in abundance. Uh, there's, there's one at the back and there's two of the side and then I'm told that if you just wander round to, to the right, you're going to get to a, to, a, to a point where we would congregate in the unlikely event of a fire. Good. So without further ado, um, the way that this is going to run is we'll have two talks uh, from uh, Dementia's Platform UK um, and also from our hosts. Uh, from the University of Bristol. Uh, then I'll speak to you about where we're at in terms of uh, Alzheimer's disease research and, and where things are heading. Uh, then we'll have a short break and then we'll have uh, two more presentations on the outlook uh, for dementia, particularly around treatments and also around uh, the collaboration between, between academia and industry and what we do on that front. Good. So, without further ado, the first person I'm going to call up to speak uh, is Professor John Gallagher, who's a Professor of Cognitive Health at the University of Oxford, and he's the lead for the Dementia's Platform UK project. Well, thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, as I say, according to the programme, I'm John Gallagher, which is always a good place to start at the Dementia's Conference. Um, hello, SleepQuest. Um, good to see you, and for those, that, uh, those of you who are online, hello, great minds out there, uh, several hundred of you. It's uh, fantastic that you can join us. Um, to me, this is a fantastic joy and privilege to be able to speak to you, um, because as we will find out over the next few minutes, uh, you are dementia research's greatest asset, and that is without uh, 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 any exaggeration. Uh, whatsoever. And what I'd like to do is just to help you understand more clearly that. Ah. That's it. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. So um, this is, uh, I'm director of the Dementias Platform UK which is a large national initiative funded by the MRC. Uh, it's a public-private partnership. Uh, we work closely with all sectors, with philanthropy, uh, with the third sector in terms of dementia charities. We have commercial uh, industry partners as well and a broad range of academic partners. And the reason why we do this is that uh, we don't think any one sector has got the resources to uh, change the outlook uh, for dementia. So, for example, academics are fantastic, that's what they're meant to be, at coming up with good ideas. That's great. But if you try and persuade an academic to take it through the process to, of treatment, registered, licensed, accepted by the NHS, they're just not equipped to do that. All right? So they, they, they get bored, for one thing, uh, and um, uh, they are on to the next big idea, which is lovely if you like big ideas, not so good if you like treatments. So we're very pleased to work with all sectors to uh, improve the availability or even achieve the availability of cheap treatments. Now, uh, for those of you who like graphs, uh, for those of you who are history graduates, this is a graph. Um, for those of you who like graphs, what I've got here is the in the gray, the number of publications on dementia over the last 50 or so years. And you can see that 50 years ago, there were very, very few. Uh, the publications all about heart disease, cancer, other things. But over the last 20, 30 years, the increase has been exponential. 
If you look at, break down those publications by the sorts of designs, the sorts of studies that are being conducted, you'll find that long-term cohorts are on the rise and clinical trials are on the rise. But what's taken a long time to take off is the idea of research registers. Now, research registers are groups of people who are willing to be recontacted for the purposes of research. And that means great minds. That means our clinical studies register. And what I want to do over the next 10 minutes is really help you understand why you are so important. So let's just look at the, these are the biggest registers around the world. So there are very few of them. These are, these are the, the best ones that there are. And uh, in Barcelona, you have a, a relatively small register, but it, can, it collects data on medical history, baseline cognition, serial cognition, genotyping, and does brain imaging. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Then you get down to other registers like Joint Dementia Research, and they just take medical history. And then you've got various other registers. And here we have Great Minds, 7,000 plus, and we collect everything in small proportions except the brain imaging. What this means is that different registers can recruit at different levels of detail. Okay? Now, dementia is very, very complicated. And the more detailed information you have when you're recruiting someone to a study, the greater the chances of success of that study and the lower the cost of that study for two simple reasons. The chance of success is greater because you know exactly who you're talking to, who you're measuring, their background, their disease status. The cost is lower because you have fewer people who fail the screen. You take them in, you do all these, you do all these tests, and all of a sudden, oh, they're not suitable. And you've wasted their time, and you've wasted the researcher's time, and it's cost, wasted, frankly, a lot of money. So to be able to measure in, in great detail um, how pe before people get enrolled into studies is a really, really important aspect of, of dementia research. And one which is um, only recently, as I showed you in the previous graph, been recognized. And what I want to say is those of you who are part of Great Minds are, really are at the cutting edge of dementia research. So in DPUK, we focus on being purpose-driven. Okay, what we're trying to do is identify the mechanisms which underlie dementia and then do very targeted studies on those mechanisms to see how we can affect change. So, for example, it might be to do with your synapses. How is your brain health? It might be to do with your heart and your, your vascular system. How are your arteries? It might be to do with the inflammatory system. What, what sort of diseases are you carrying which will affect your risk of dementia? And so what we do is we focus on the problems, on the mechanisms, and then design the studies around them. <clears throat> so let's look at DPUK broadly, okay? Uh, we are funded by MRC primarily, and we have a data portal, where we, and I'll show you more detail about this. We have over 1,000 access requests over the last few. This is, one of the, this is a world-leading data access platform. Um, we have very rapid turnaround times for our access requests. And if you were an academic, you'd be standing up and cheering at this now, okay? Because frequently it takes months and months and months to get the permission to access the data, to do the work, to publish it. And we've gone out of our way to streamline this. Secondly, we, do, we have what we call a trial delivery framework, and Great Minds is a part of this. And the point of this trial delivery framework is to recruit people quickly into studies and to do these studies quickly, if only so we know what doesn't work. It's better to know what doesn't work within six months rather than taking three years to know what doesn't work. So it's not that we have all the answers, but we're trying to make the process as quick as we can. And then we have an experimental medicine incubator where we say, okay, we have an idea. We can recruit the people, let's go and test it. Then we work with industry to get this test done as quickly as we can. So that's DPUK as, as a whole, and that's part, of, that's part of Ivan's work as well as part of mine. <clears throat> let's just look at our data portal for a a, a brief minute. 
If you were a geneticist, you would just love to have all the genetic information you could possibly have. And if you were a brain imager, you'd love to have, I want to see all these brain images. I, I must confess, it wouldn't do it for me, but it does it for brain images, okay? I would, I would love to see all of this. Then if you were an epidemiologist, you might say, oh, I just want to see the data. The, give me the questionnaire data. Well, what we do in Deep UK is help all of these people to access all of these data by pre-processing them and making them more simpler. So here we have raw, very, very complex data. We pre-process it so that each, indi each individual scientist around the world can have their own laboratory within our computer where they do the analysis. And Sarah, who will speak to you later, really is the architect of all this. So if you've got complicated questions about how it works, you ask Sarah. Is that okay? You'll get a much more sensible answer than from me. But nevertheless, this is a global first. And it's a global first that your data contribute to. And it enables, um, whether you live in Manchester or Malawi, it enables you to test the best ideas on the best data and come up with answers rapidly. And this is our, our data management. This report goes to MRC every month. And you can see that um, we have uh, scientists all over the world working on this. We're a bit, we're a bit low in Africa with a grand total of zero. But we're working on that this summer. We hope to have that changed by the end of the year. And we have, uh, this is the, if you like, the speed at which we turn around uh, re requests. This is the request by month. We have 808 users in 33 countries looking at 50 data sets. This is amazing, okay? Nowhere else, nowhere else can claim this level of access. And again, it is your data, it is your goodwill, it is your willingness to contribute to dementia research which makes this possible. And I would just like to say once again how grateful, how grateful we are to you. Let's look at our experimental medicine studies. We run, we're currently running 19 studies across nine centers looking at synaptic health, vascular health, and neuroimmunology. But do you know what the biggest challenge is? The biggest challenge is enrollment by what we call phenotype according to genotype. Now, this is a technical term. Bear with me, all right? Phenotype is what you say, what you do, what your brain looks like, what your arteries look like, how tall you are, and if you're getting rather wider, like, like some people, like some one person in this room, it is certainly, at least that's the comment to my grandchildren, we move on quickly, um, whether your genotype is your genetics. <clears throat> and if you can measure someone, characterize them by both their genetic risk and their phenotypic risk, you have a really good idea of exactly who they are and whether they are suitable for this study or for that study. So it really, really is important. And we are working hard to be able to say to industry and academic researchers, we can do this. This will reduce your cost. This will speed up your research. This will give you better findings. This will accelerate the development of treatments. That's what we're after. <clears throat> And if we look at uh, who you are, great minds out there, if we look at who you are, um, we have people from all over the UK. Uh, and um, uh, I just, we, we are doing five studies at the moment uh, where people are being recruited to from within the register. Uh, and these, we're just, these, these are working out how best to do it. And we are extremely grateful for all of you who've agreed to participate in these studies. And we look forward to, over the next 12 months to rolling out more and more studies. So as you get the invitation, we do think that you take it seriously and consider uh, supporting this work. And when somebody does, uh, uh, when a user wants to say, yes, we want people from Great Minds, we've got this lovely tool. And what this tool says is, look, uh, we have uh, 7,000 people. Uh, what, we'd what would you like? Would you like somebody in a particular age range? Uh, would you like somebody uh, with a particular cognitive score? Uh, would you like somebody with a particular medical history? And then we allow the researchers to narrow down their, their, their field of view. So we might say, oh, we need, I need somebody who's in Cardiff. All right, so these are the people that live within 40 miles of Cardiff. Or somebody who lives in North Wales, or somebody who lives in London. And again, it's open there. Anyone can, can uh, any user can do it. 
We might want to see people who are healthy or people who are not so healthy. And again, we can select on that basis. We might want to see people who have a particular cognitive function. We might want to have people who have a very good cognitive function, actually a very poor cognitive No, it's a good one, isn't it? And people who have a very poor cognitive function. And again, it's, it's narrowing it down to uh, particular use cases. And we might want to say, well, what sort of study would you like? Would you like to be involved in a trial? Or would you like to be involved in an imaging study? Or would you not like to be involved in an imaging study? And again, we can help cater for your preferences so that you only get requests that you are interested in supporting. <clears throat> and we're developing this now into our trial delivery framework with under Vanessa Raymond. And uh, it's been really helpful, and I just want to... Uh, mentioned Bristol here uh, with, with Liz, who's been really supportive. And the idea here is that we standardize procedures across the UK so that we can do these trials quicker and do them cheaper and do them better. It's really straightforward like that. And centers like Bristol are absolutely critical in helping this to go because this is a strong research center. And if Bristol joins in, if Oxford joins in, if Cardiff joins in, then actually it's more likely that other centres will join in as well. <clears throat> and finally, your study needs you, okay? So as I said at the very beginning, you really are, you really are the, the most important part of the dementia research framework. And uh, we'd like to think that uh, uh, you will continue to support our work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Um, as you say, um, Dementia's Platform UK has been, I think it's fair to say, transformational for, uh, for our ability as, as clinical researchers to approach people and to really give the opportunity of, uh, of those of us <clears throat> who want to help out in, in research as volunteers to actually uh, put their hand up and, uh, and, and contribute to studies where our, our participation will be most informative. And that's really what we've tried to do here. Uh, but again, you know, with, with all of these uh, research endeavours, it's, it's all about the collaboration, it's all about who you, you're working with. And, and John, John, as John said, we're very lucky to have uh, Liz Coulthard as, as our collaborator. Liz is, a, an, is an Associate Professor of Dementia Neurology here at Bristol. Um, and also she leads a research group which focuses on the early detection of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease and new treatments. Uh, and uh, Liz is also the, the, the study lead for, for, uh, for SleepQuest, which uh, some of you may have uh, uh, maybe here through, through that study. So Liz will, will give her intros to the talks. Thank you. Of course. <coughs> Hello. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. It's really great to host Dementia's Platform UK in Bristol. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about SleepQuest now. I'm going to keep it really brief because I'm talking for longer later. <laughs> and I think the uh, uh, brief might be better now. So um, to think about SleepQuest, we have to think back to um, March 2020, if you don't mind, Hor horrifying as it is. Um, at that time, um, we were entering a, a, a new phase and we didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, people were being locked down um, for the first time and um, people over 70 were identified as an at-risk group. Um, and obviously a lot of the patients that I see as a clinician are in that age group. We know that people in later life um, accrue health problems, including dementia. Um, and that some of those health problems some, can lead to dementia. And in particular, there's fairly good evidence that sleep disturbance can
can put people at risk of dementia. So there were reports coming through that people's sleep was affected by the pandemic and by the lockdown. And as researchers, we also couldn't do any face-to-face -face research, so we couldn't see our participants, we couldn't do drug trials as usual. So we felt that it would be useful to understand what was happening to people uh, in their homes. And the way that we could do this was through questionnaires, online questionnaires. Uh, so we set up SleepQuest extremely quickly. So I've never set up a study as quickly in my life. And um, uh, we, it was set up within um, a couple of weeks, really. And so we, got, we were able to test people within the full UK lockdown in March. And our main hypothesis was that some of the stress that was occurring during that first lockdown may have long-term implications for the sleep of people, particularly older people, and particularly people at risk of dementia, and that that could lead to a vicious circle whereby people were stressed, their sleep was worse, therefore they were already at risk of dementia, and that, that, that became worse. So I'm going to give a few of the results from SleepQuest. But I'm going to explain why I'm not going to give all the results. And the reason is that um, when we set up Sleep Quest, we wanted to take a long-term view. So in March 2020, we said, well, let's follow people up so we can see what happens um, in the long term when the pandemic's over. So we set up a follow-up for November 2020, when we thought by then it'll all, you know, we'll be all right and, and we'll see what's happened. And obviously, as you all know, really we didn't know in March what was going to happen. So we do have one lot of follow-up data, but we're going to do more follow-up and that's going to be uh, later this year. We're going to coincide it with the second um, data acquisition. So we're going to coincide it in terms of time of year, so November 2022 as long as there are no new variants and nothing else happens and it looks like we're back to normal life. So, um, so these are provisional data. Um, uh, uh, and what I wanted to add at this point is that when we set this up in two weeks, uh, we had amazing input from our patient and public involvement group, and if you're listening, you'll know who you are, um, who worked really with us. And it's the first time that I've worked so closely with uh, patients and the public to set up research in such a rapid way. We had people looking over all the questionnaires, doing it for us, giving us feedback, telling us if it, if it worked, if it was glitchy on their machines. And I, so I really want to say thank you, firstly, um, to the people who helped us set this up. Um, and also to everybody who took part. So uh, 3,500 people took part during the first UK lockdown, and then a further 2,500 uh, agreed to be followed up in November 2020. Do you know what? Their sleep was generally worse. So we got people to estimate whether their sleep was worse in the first lockdown um, compared to how they had been pre-lockdown. And overall, people were worse. The su slightly surprising thing was that some people actually had better sleep. And actually, there have been some other studies that haven't got the depth or the longitudinal follow-up that we've got, but have looked into this in more detail. And it seems that sleep maybe got better in some people who always had to get up for work at 5 a.m., but actually that wasn't their natural rhythm. So when the lockdown happened and they could get up at their normal time, um, they actually started to sleep a bit better. But unfortunately, overall, sleep was made worse by COVID and the lockdown. Um, the surprising thing was what, 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 what we sort of were worried about seemed to happen in that sleep didn't improve between those two periods. So between March and November 2020, sleep didn't improve, whereas people's anxiety and depression did improve. So our hypothesis at the start was that there may be a long-term cost to sleep of this relatively short-lived um, stressful period. Uh, may be true, but we, as, as I said, we haven't really done the long-term data yet because we need to wait. Um, and then we looked at some factors that were linked to continued poor sleep. And unfortunately, we found that caring responsibilities and cognitive impairment were two of the factors that were linked to continued poor sleep. So um, obviously, for our patients, this isn't the best news. Uh, but what it's leading us to is what can we do about this? And this is really helping us to generate, with our patient and public involvement group, uh, interventions. How can we help? Uh, so that's what we're setting up now. And um, we've got some studies starting. Uh, our, others of our studies are looking at how can we really measure sleep? Because here we used a questionnaire, which was good, but it doesn't tell us all the features of sleep that we really need to understand. So we're looking at other ways, other devices to measure sleep. 
And our plan in the long term is to look to see how we can help people protect their brain health through better sleep and to see if that in turn helps to prevent dementia. That's our programme of work. And my last slide um, echoes Professor Gallagher's slide, uh, which is to say that what we really need is you. So that you're, you're, you're our most important resource. We couldn't do it without you. We are starting uh, studies now. We're doing studies in people who are healthy with no cognitive impairment, in people who have early memory symptoms, and, and some studies in people who have Alzheimer's and other dementias. So um, Victoria, who's at the back there, has agreed to have her email address here. And if anybody's interested in taking part in our studies, then you can drop us a line. Another really good way to take part in studies is through Join Dementia Research, which is a national resource that was mentioned in Professor Gallagher's talk. So I'm going to stop there and just say thank you for helping with SleepQuest. Thanks. Thank you very much, Liz, and, and thank you again for hosting us. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to start seeing people face to face after a long time. Uh, now we're going to go into uh, the main part of this event, which is going to be three talks about um, various aspects of our knowledge about uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Um, we have set up some, some time for questions. So after each talk, which will be about 20 minutes, uh, we'll leave about five minutes for, for questions either through the people here or uh, people online uh, who can post the questions in the comments section of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of where they can see the video. And then at the end, um, we're also going to have a panel uh, Q&A with, with all the speakers where uh, we, can, we can, you know, deep dive into some of the questions we haven't been able to answer. Good. Okay. Well... To start off, you have me. I'm sorry to say, uh, but I'll, I'll try and do I'll try and do justice to a, to a very important topic. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm Ivan. I'm a uh, clinical researcher at Oxford. Um, I lead uh, uh, the, the Great Minds Research Register and also clinical trials, looking at whether we can repurpose compounds uh, that are used elsewhere in medicine for uh, for the prevention of dementia. Uh, and, and, and I also work for the NHS as a, as a consultant neuropsychiatrist. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is Alzheimer's disease, what we know about it now, and uh, where are things headed in, in the foreseeable future? Because with all of these events, it's always important to, to, keep, uh, to, to keep sight of the fact that, you know, we all want to know what's coming around the corner rather than uh, what is a, uh, you know, has just been found to make mice slightly better. So... Um, Alzheimer's disease, um, it's, it's a disease of, of the brain, uh, we know that, um, and already uh, by the time that uh, Alzheimer's disease, essentially Alzheimer, uh, Alois Alzheimer, uh, if you like, defined the disease, he already knew that there's certain pathology happening in the brain. Um, so what, what he saw were what he called amyloid plaques. These are if you like uh, uh, these um, uh, these pluck, uh, these uh, clumps of protein that form in between neurons, uh, and you can see them here on the left. There, it's called an amyloid plaque. Um, and what what this this uh, this neuropathologist in Germany saw was that in somebody who's essentially was profoundly uh, disabled in terms of her memory, uh, when when this person unfortunately died. Uh, the, the brain had shrunk and it, was, it, was, it had lost a lot of matter. And then when he looked under the microscope, he could see these plaques that were in between the, in between the neurons. Uh, he didn't necessarily know what it means, but you know, he, was <clears throat> he, he reported this finding. What we now know is that these amyloid plaques start to, to build up in, uh, in, in people's brains, uh, usually around the fifth and the sixth decade. Um, and uh, they, if they, they build up, uh, they, they, they build up throughout the brain. There's no particular localization, uh, but it's it's another protein called tau, <clears throat> which, unlike amyloid, is formed uh, into clumps within the neurons, and it's this tau protein that is particularly toxic. And the thinking is, that's at least the amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease, is that once you come up, you come to a critical level of the amyloid protein in the brain, if you like, that's the trigger 
that uh, releases this second protein tau, which then starts to uh, really suffocate the neurons. And the interesting thing about the tau protein, that unlike amyloid, which just goes through the brain uh, and, and it increases everywhere, tau has a very specific way of, uh, of propagating through the brain. So it starts from what we call the medial temporal lobe, that is the, the bit of the brain that sits, if you like, just, on, just behind the, the ears. Uh, and, and this is where, for example, uh, the, 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 the centers of the brain that have to do with organizing your memories. Uh, so in typical Alzheimer's disease, this tau protein starts to, starts to build up there and then starts moving in a very predictable fashion through, uh, through regions of the brain to the extent that we can now we can now, if you like, stage Alzheimer's disease based on how far this tau protein has, has gone through, its, through this predetermined pathway. Uh, and that's the so-called BRAC staging, which you can see here on the bottom. So starting from the medial temporal lobe and then gradually moving along this, this you know, predefined pathway until it reaches the whole of the brain. The, whole of the, uh, the, 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 brain. the next question is, when does, when does Alzheimer's disease start? Um, there is a form of Alzheimer's disease where you get, you know, you, 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 you are quite unlucky to have a, a mutation in your genes that, that makes it certain that you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease. This is the so-called familiar Alzheimer's disease, and these people develop it uh, usually in their 50s, so a lot younger than, than when people normally get dementia. What people have been able to do, it specifically in the States, is to... Uh, is to create cohorts of people who are the children of people who have had early onset Alzheimer's disease. They've genetically tested them. They've, uh, they've confirmed that they have these unlucky mutations. And then they've started looking at the buildup of their proteins starting from, from, the, from, the people's in, from people in their 20s. Okay? And they've carried on until they, they got to 50 and 60 and developed dementia. And what they saw is that the first changes associated with the Alzheimer's disease process happens about 20 years before you have any symptoms whatsoever. Okay? So the first thing that people saw was that the amyloid level, the sort of this protein, if you remember, that clumps in plaques in between neurons, start to, starts to disappear from your cerebrospinal fluid, and it disappears because it, it goes and it clumps into these into these plaques and, and, and there's uh, essentially little, you know, there's, there's not that much of it escaping the brain. So that's the yellow line here. So it starts to drop around 20 years before first symptom. The orange line is, is, the, is the clumping of these, of these plaques. You can see that the two, uh, the two run contrary to each other. Then about 10 years before first symptoms, you start to see these tau protein, the really toxic, the bullet, start to, start to go up. Uh, in people's brains. Then about five years before first symptoms, the, the blue line, that's if you like, the, the density of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the area of the brain which is in the medial temporal lobe, sort of behind the ears, and helping you organize your memories. Uh, this is where you start to see the loss, of, the loss of tissue. So that happens about five years, again, before you get any symptoms at all. And then around that time, if you put people through a special scanner which uh, tells you which parts of the brain are eating up glucose, you start to see that, uh, that areas of the brain are starting to suffer. They're not eating up as much glucose as possible. But the, if you like, what we now know through, through, these, through this research is that Alzheimer's disease is decades in the making. Okay? So at least, at least 20 years pass before the process starts until you get any problems whatsoever and you come see or Liz in, in clinic. Um, that's perhaps concerning uh, and it's understandable, but at the same time, it speaks to the huge opportunity that we have with Alzheimer's disease and dementia because uh, if, you, if you try and intervene in a disease where already, as you can see, the, the, the process has started and has eaten away through the tissue, it's going to be so much more difficult compared to if you're able to approach people uh, while this, this process is, is, uh, is happening. Uh, 10 years before first symptoms, and there's a real hope that at that point, if, if you intervene, you're going to bring about meaningful change. The other thing that we know a lot about now is what are the risk factors? What that bring about, uh, that, that mediate the risk for Alzheimer's disease? Uh, 
Um, there are things that are where, if you like, born with. There's things that, that we, we cannot really change. Um, and out of these, certainly genetics is a factor. There is a particular type of gene called APOE, uh, and one particular version of that gene called the APOE4 allele that mediates the risk of what we'd call late onset Alzheimer's disease. In contrast, in contrast to the early onset Alzheimer's disease, that is the, the vast majority of the cases of, of Alzheimer's disease dementia are due to late onset Alzheimer's disease, usually after the age of 65. And so there's a particular genetic variant that mediates uh, you know, a substantial amount of the risk. And about 10 to 15% of the population have this. And I'll, I'll speak more about this on the next slide. But we also know that there are things that happen to us uh, during our life which mediate the risk for Alzheimer's disease. We used to think that dementia is just one of those things that happen to you and you're either lucky or unlucky, but that's not the case up to a third of all dementia cases are due to our lifestyle and to the choices that we make about how we go about our daily life. Um, and the most, the most specific ones are things that we do in early life. So education, level of education is, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. People who, uh, who, who have more f formal schooling tend to have lower risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And the interesting thing here is that, no, that it appears that it's not so much that it reduces the risk of the actual biology happening, but rather that people are able to compensate a lot better uh, for, for the deficit that the loss of tissue brings about. Uh, and so uh, for, for that reason, people speak about you know, education building up a cognitive reserve in a similar way that, for example, when athletes uh, exercise more, then their muscles are more able to withstand injury. Um, then there's things in midlife like hearing loss, high blood pressure and diabetes that mediate the risk for, the risk for, for late onset Alzheimer's disease. And then there's things in later life that also increase the risk of developing dementia. Importantly, smoking, depression, but also all forms of, of activity. So physical activity, social activity, and intellectual activities. And you hear this time and time again when, when people come to clinic that, uh, you, know, you know, about four or five years after, after on to retirement, that when people retired, there was, ooh, there was uh, there's a typical story of the person essentially reducing their levels of activity, both socially, uh, physically, and then four or five years later, they come to you with cognitive problems. Very often, this cessation of activity is a significant contributory factor. Um, uh, but yes, the, the, the big story here is that a third of all the risk factors are due to, to things we, we actually have control over. A few words on the genetic, um, on the genetic uh, risk. So this is a graph that shows the risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease according to, to, to this particular genetic variant, the APOE gene. Uh, and it's this uh, APOE4 gene which mediates uh, which mediates the, 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 the bulk of the risk. So people who have this genetic variant tend to have much quicker accumulation of the amyloid plaques, and they also uh, have um, they also have up, you know significantly higher risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia, uh, and also when they do, they uh, they develop it at an earlier age. Just to give you a sense of, of what the magnitude of the risk is. If you have one version of this gene, because you, you're probably aware that for all gene we have two versions of, of, of that gene, one's coming from mum, one's coming from dad. If you have one version of the faulty gene, as it were, you have about a four, four times higher risk of dementia. And if both your parents had this faulty gene, so you have, if you have two copies, then you run 10 times the risk uh, of dementia. That's about the risk factors. Now, on to how do we diagnose Alzheimer's disease at the moment and, and where are things headed? So nowadays, if you come to my clinic or, or anyone else's clinic, the, the, way that the, the way that the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's, uh, probable Alzheimer's disease is made is not particularly complex, okay? You're relying on the evidence that the person has what we'd call a cognitive deficit so difficulty in one of the main 
um, areas of, 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 of memory, or one, one of the main cognitive functions. So things like memory, ability to work out problems, verbal fluency. So one of these problems is, one of these areas is suffering. The second thing is that it follows a typical progressive course. So it's been going on for, uh, for at least 12 months. And then the third component is that it brings about a, or it associates with a significant decline in everyday function. When you put these three things together, you have probable Alzheimer's disease, dementia. But where are we heading? We're heading towards this thing on the bottom, which is the amyloid tau in neurodegeneration framework of Alzheimer's disease. So less of diagnosis by interview and diagnosis by, uh, if you like, pen and paper tests, and more about diagnosing people on the underlying biology. Uh, so what this framework does, it looks for the evidence that the person has amyloid in their brain, that they have tau in their brain, and also that the brain has started to suffer. So there's ever evidence that the nerve cells are dying off. And when you put these three factors together, now we can define actual, uh, actually biological, the biological form of Alzheimer's disease, where if you remember my first slide, this can be done uh, 10 or 15 years before you have any symptoms we can actually, when we run these tests, we can, say, we can say that the person has Alzheimer's disease uh, in the making. They have, if they have the biological basis of it. So how do we investigate Alzheimer's disease? Uh, and I'll talk about the, the four main things and uh, what's currently done and where, what we're likely to see in the future. Cognition, at the moment in the clinic, you do these pen and paper tests where we, we test your memory, we test how you work out problems, and then we give you a score. Now, there's obviously limitations to this. The main one is that this really is targeting people who have a significant deficit. This is done for people who have dementia or are near enough to dementia. And if you, if you have very subtle deficits, if you're five years, for example, before, before developing dementia, this is not going to show much. Okay, so it really isn't well suited for what we're trying to do, which is trying to find the people early, early on and to try and, and stop the disease before it starts to cause irreversible damage. Where things are, are, are going in the near future is that at least one of the avenues in terms of cognitive testing is harnessing the power of, of digital technology. Most of us uh, have a form of digital technology that we own, uh, and certainly one way of doing it is to uh, install apps that people use in short bursts, uh, where they uh, they remember inf they they're given tasks to remember information, uh, and and make it really like games, so that people actually enjoy enjoy them and they come back to them for two or three minutes a day. But what that, what that gives you is that it allows you to do things that are simply impossible for me or for Liz to do in clinic. We only have an hour with the patient, so we can only test your memory at most 20, 30 minutes after we've given you information. If you have these types of tests, then uh, what, if, we, if you have these types of apps, then what you can do is you can test people's memory five or six, seven days later at no effort. We just ping you a sort of a, a test. Do you remember whether in that task you saw an animal or was it, uh, was it furniture, right? And research has shown that if you're able to test people after five or six or seven days, you're much more able to pick out the people who are at risk of Alzheimer's disease uh, than with things that you do on the day. And the other great advantage, this is one project that we've been running, is that if you like, this democratizes the access to dementia research because no longer do you need to be within 10, 10 miles of Oxford or 10 miles of Bristol in order to take part of research. It's the sort of, uh, it's the sort of um, uh, thing that you can download on your, on your app and participate in research from, uh, from, 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 an island, uh, from an island in Scotland. This is a heat map of where the downloads of our app were happening uh, with more than 12, with more than 11,000 people. Um, and you, 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 you really see that if you give people the opportunity to contribute to research, they are willing. Uh, and so that is one, uh, one, one, one way to do it. Another way uh, for, for cognitive uh, uh, testing to happen in the future is through the use of wearable devices. Again, what we've done here, for example, is we've, we've devised this system where people wear a digital uh, watch that, that picks up with Bluetooth uh, these so-called beacons which are placed around your house, one in the kitchen, one in the study, one in the bedroom. And so as you move around the house, 
this watch is picking up the bleeps from, from the beacons and so it knows how much time you're spending in each room, what your navigation is around the house and in that way you can pick out very small deviations of your normal behaviour uh, and sort of pick out that something uh, potentially isn't quite right. Um, moving on to neurodegeneration, what we currently do is we put people through a scanner. Uh, this is an MRI scan and then we look at the volume of, these, of the tissue, particularly uh, of, the med of the medial temporal lobe, the, the bit that sits behind the ears, which is this structure here. Um, so we, we, look at the, we look at the size of it. Uh, and, and based on this, we can, if it's, if it's really shrunken compared to the rest of the brain, we say, well, this is highly likely neurodegeneration due to Alzheimer's disease. We can also, as I say, put you through a scanner where we give you glucose, which is labelled with radioactivity, and we can see which areas of the brain are not eating up as much glucose as we would expect. And in that way, we can differentiate the causes of different, of different dementias. Now, where things are headed is that now we have the types of blood tests that is actually picking up in the blood that something in, in the brain isn't functioning quite as nice. It's, uh, it has, has, it's not functioning as, as expected. So as neurons die, there are proteins like this one here, which is called neurofilament light, which essentially it's a structural protein and helps the, the, the nerve cells uh, to maintain their function. So as the nerve cells uh, die off, uh, or a suffering, then there's more of this protein that gets released in the blood. And with new techniques, we're now are able to pick this up in, in, in blood, and we can tell that this person is losing more nerve cells than, than expected for, for, for their age. And you can see that uh, here on the right are the different types of conditions where you see nerve cell loss. For example, in, in multiple sclerosis, uh, there's, there's a lot of use of this particular protein, but certainly in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, I realise that I have a couple more slides, but uh, I'll round off by saying that the other two proteins, the way that we currently measure them are, uh, so these are the amyloid and the tau proteins, typically is through a lumbar puncture. So you have a needle through your back, it pierces this sheath which covers, uh, which co which covers the spinal cord, there's the, and you get access to the, to the fluid, which, if you like, baits your whole spinal cord and goes all the way to the brain. So if you like, it's the same homogeneous fluid going all the way to the brain. And by doing that, you get a very good sense of what, of what environment the brain lives in, in a way. And it's super informative. It's been sort of in the armament of medicine for, uh, for, for, for a century. Uh, but not many people fancy having a spinal tap. Uh, even for research, although it depends how persuasive you are. Um, I can see Liz smiling. Uh, but, uh, but ultimately, it's not something that you can, you can, uh, you can roll out. It's not, it's not something you can do to screen people, for example, for dementia. So the way that things are, are moving on is we have these types of scans for amyloid and for tau, where again, a bit like the glucose, you label a particular protein which targets the amyloid, uh, the amyloid plaque. Uh, and you inject it and then you put people through the scanner and if there is the protein in the brain then it starts to glow and the scanner picks it up and that's what it looks like. On the right you see lots of red areas so this is areas in the brain where there's a lot of amyloid that's been retained and on the left is a negative scan so the, the tracer, this protein that you injected is just washed through and, and there's no retention. The same thing goes for tau. We now have these things that we, uh, these, these methods that we inject the thing targeting the tau protein and we can now see, if you remember this thing that I was talking about staging Alzheimer's disease, we can now see how far along this tau progression people are. So we now talk about staging Alzheimer's disease in living people just the same way that we talk about staging cancer. So it's real shift. Um, and uh, the other thing to mention about tau proteins and amyloid proteins is that similar to the neurodegeneration protein that I mentioned, the neurofilament light, we now have the types of blood tests that can determine if there's buildup of amyloid and there's buildup of tau in the brain. Um, I see that I've run out of time. I was going to tell you about some experimental uh, things that we're doing, uh, but I think I've, I've put my, my main messages across there's a lot happening in dementia research. Things have definitely moved on. Even five or ten years ago, we now have, we're, not talk, we're now able to 
diagnose Alzheimer's disease in a completely different way. We have uh, blood tests, which will be, I, I believe, certainly they're ready, and, and it's just a quick case of when the healthcare system will find their place uh, in, in screening programs and whether the screening programs will be seen as, as worth it, because that is also a consideration. Uh, but our, 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 our tools of dealing with, with this horrible disease have certainly expanded massively in the, in the last in the last five or ten years. I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, just to echo what was said, we can really only make these advances through the goodwill of, of people who, who want to help, help out brain health research uh, and who are, are willing to donate their very, very valuable data to us as researchers, both to analyse it, but also to bring them in for studies that we now know they'll be a perfect fit for. And that's what I had to talk to you today. Thank you very much. I think Simon can help me whether we have any time for questions or whether we can leave it to the Q&A. We've got time for some questions. Um, and if anybody's online, uh, if they can post their questions in the chat, please. But we've got one question here in the room. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm Trisha, this is Howard. Um, we actually belong to the research organisation called RICE. Um, is RICE part of, of, of you or is it not? And if not, why not? I don't, because this, everything you said today is fantastic and if we're not on your research list, then we definitely want to be on it, please. So, I, I, do you, are you part of RICE? Well, I, I'm not familiar with RICE. There's a microphone. I don't know if RICE are directly involved, actually, at this moment, but it, you need to join an established cohort to be part of Great Minds, don't you, I think? You, we, we've done Howard's done lots of research with them, and I'm thinking, well, how far has that gone if you've got such a large database? Just, just to make sure that, you know, because we have people online, if you, if you can use the microphone, so that we can... Yeah, just, just to make sure that, you know, because we have people online, if you, if you can use the microphone, so that we can, you know, participate in this hybrid way of interacting nowadays. Sorry, I don't even know if this is an appropriate question really at this stage, but I'd, Howard's done quite a lot of research, because Howard... Yeah, I, have, I have got dementia. Yeah, yeah. Has Alzheimer's. That's what I'm doing, Alzheimer's. Or yeah, so that's, that's why we're here. Yes. And he's been under, on their books now for six years, and he was actually um, diagnosed last year. Um, but if he's doing all this research, what and it's not included with you, that's rather a shame, isn't it? I, I completely agree. I think, uh, I don't know whether you want to take this, John, but um, it's certainly the way that Dementia's Platform UK works and Great Minds work is in investigators and research projects are invited to join us. Obviously, it's up to the investigators. That's the way that the research, if you like, governance work, whether they, they join us or not. I'm, I'm not sure that we've been in touch with Rice specifically, but I think it's definitely a pointer. We, would be we are very inclusive. We are very inclusive and we would be delighted to work with Rice on this. I'm not speaking for Rice. No, no. No, but it's, it's good. It's, thank you for raising it. Um, but we would be delighted to work with Rice on this. But, but in any case, there's also the option to... Uh, to join Great Minds, uh, in, sort of individually, if you like. Um, so, so there's definitely, you know, we've made it easy, either way. Good. All right. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, you mentioned there are lots of tests that have been come about in the last five or ten years. How far are these out into the field, where people are actually being used in, using these tests to test people? Yeah. I mean, I asked this question. I, my mother had severe. Um, Alzheimer's disease, so I was aware that I was getting it, and I went for tests, and they said, no, you haven't got it. Mm. Yeah. So um, that's what I, I sort of, I tried to sort of link it up into what, what is available currently. So here, for example, on the left, you can see the current things that we do uh, are certainly the pen and paper tests. Some, paper, some places are using computerized tests, but in terms of imaging, mostly people are getting the MRI scans and you look at the, if you like, the density of the tissue and if you're in a specialist centre then they may want to give you a lumbar puncture and then look at the, the levels of the different proteins. In the near future we will have these PET scans, we're certainly using them for research, 
So the PET scans are the ones where you, you are injecting the, the, the particles which are targeting either the amyloid or the tau protein. Um, and uh, they're, if you like, they're approved for use, but at the moment they tend to be confined to research um, simply because, you know, they are expensive tests. And in the absence of a, of a, of a therapy which is, you know, proven to work, uh, then you can see how from, from the healthcare, point of, healthcare system point of view, it doesn't yet make sense for them to invest in a £2,000 investigation for somebody then they wouldn't be able to necessarily offer something that uh, immediately, uh, that sort of, if you like, changes their treatment. But Liz is going to talk after the coffee break about where we're heading for treatments. And I think, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, you may have seen through the news where there's been some advances and there's been some new treatments which have been, uh, if you like, given provisional approval. So I think we're very close to the two things aligning where suddenly there will be a treatment and we're ready there with the tests. So these tests will, will, will sort of follow. Just one, just one quick question from the uh, people watching online, uh, which follows on from that. Um, if we can identify loss in blood, why don't we scan everyone over a certain age? Yeah, well, I think that's, that's a very interesting question. And that will be a debate that will be had, I'm sure, because, you know, Ultimately, we are now we have been in position to screen people for blood maybe for one or two one or two years. Okay, the next question, the next, if you like, big decision that needs to be made by healthcare system is is it worth it? Okay, because we've known that there are screening programs that have happened. Some of them have, have gone very very well, and some have gone have gone very very badly. Okay, and it's the question of, 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 of what makes a good screening program for, 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 for dementia. The, the, you know, the screening programs, when they haven't gone well, is A, for example, where you have to screen a tremendous amount of people and you start missing things. Okay, uh, this happened, for example, with breast screening, um, where you know, women were screened and then they were given, they were said, oh, you, you're fine, and actually it turns out that it was missed on the screening. Okay, so you need to be thinking about resource to make sure that things are not missed. And on the other hand, you can think about, for example, the screening prostate, uh, the screening program for prostate cancer, where this was rolled out, and we suddenly started to pick out all of these cancers in men uh, that weren't picked out before. They had to start going through these invasive surgeries to remove them, and then it turned out that only a proportion of these prostate cancers were actually ever going to cause a problem. Okay, so it turns out that this screening program was picking up a lot of cancers that, if you like, were self-limiting in, in the prostate. Uh, and that's the way it can go in the, other, in the other direction. But as you know, Alzheimer's disease, if you like, is, is much bigger than that because anyone over the age of 65 is at risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So when we do roll out uh, a screening program, it needs to be carefully considered from, from these two points. But yeah, I think it, it will be a public debate to be had in the very near future. Good. All right. I'm, I'm being shown the sign that it's time for cake and for coffee. Unfortunately, that won't be able to, we won't be able to provide that online. Uh, but I'm sure that you have facilities near you. We are going to take 10 minutes for, for, this, for this activity and then we're coming back to two excellent talks, one, one by Liz about the future of and where we are, uh, the, the, the current status and the future of dementia treatments and Sarah Baumeister uh, from, from Oxford is to, going to talk about how, uh, how, how we work with, with industry partners to bring about new treatments and new discoveries. Good, okay, well for those of you here enjoy the, enjoy the break.
So, I are we good? Hope we've all had a, a, a good coffee and cake break. This, as uh, it always works well. Good. Swiftly moving on is the, our second main talk uh, from uh, from Liz Coulthard, who uh, we've introduced already. So she's going to talk about the emerging treatment options for dementia. Welcome. So I think it's an exciting time for um, treating dementia. Most of my talk focuses on Alzheimer's disease as, as the commonest form of dementia, uh, but maybe we can discuss later if anyone wants to talk about other forms of dementia. Uh, right, just an overview. I'm going to talk, I thought it'd be useful just to contextualise what's available now, um, what treatments are in the pipeline, and I couldn't help doing a little focus on sleep because that's my area of interest, and also what will the future look like, what is the perfect future in dementia research. So, Ivan's also already laid this out. There's a really slow transition from having a healthy brain to developing Alzheimer's disease. And during that time, most of the time, people function normally. So, for many years, people function normally and then start to notice problems quite well into the course of the illness. During the time when everything appears normal, Patients start to accumulate um, sticky proteins, so amyloid and tau, in the brain that cause wearing away of some brain cells. And the amyloid's probably the first one, and then the, then tau, probably. Um, we, now, we now know that there are many other processes that occur alongside amyloid and tau, and those are the focus of some of the treatments that I'm going to talk about later. But amyloid and tau are the hallmark pathologies that we've been able to diagnose and view at post-mortem for years. When we talk about treatment, we can separate it into preventive treatments. So um, prevention, and even when we think about prevention, there's two types. I'm going to clump them together, but we can think about prevention of any problem at all. So you keep a healthy brain that never, ever gets any of the amyloid or tau. So that's primary prevention or secondary prevention, which is... Once you've got a little bit of amyloid and tau, a tau, prevent it from progressing to give you any problems. But that's prevention of any symptoms. Then we can talk about slowing decline. So at the, at the time when you first start to get symptoms and go into a phase called mild cognitive impairment, can we slow that decline so that you never get to the dementia phase where day-to-day -day activity is really limited? And then there's the symptomatic treatment when people have established symptoms, established dementia, uh, can we actually improve quality of life even if we can't change the underlying disease? So I'm broadly thinking about treatment in these three phases. So I, I'm quite justified in leaving a slide blank here because um, there, there are no evidence-based treatments that prevent dementia. Um, at least there are none that we've actually done as dementia clinicians. So, um, there was a trial run by cardiology doctors um, that was looking at intensive blood pressure control uh, compared to standard blood pressure control in older people but without established dementia. And they actually had to stop this trial early because what they were really interested in was whether intensive blood pressure control would stop people having heart attacks and dying. And it really did. <laughs> so, it's definitely a good thing to have your blood pressure controlled very well. Um, and then they looked through all their other outcomes, and one of the other outcomes they looked at um, was development of mild cognitive impairment or dementia, and as a secondary outcome, they showed some fairly convincing change in the people developing mild cognitive impairment and, and dementia. So actually, if we can do one thing to prevent, although it's not completely proven, I think it's tight control of blood pressure before you get any symptoms. I think... and. Anyway, we know that's going to help with heart disease, so that, that, that's a good thing to do. So moving on to slowing decline, again, unfortunately I could leave this slide blank, but there is a little bit more progress this time led by um, uh, dementia researchers. So 
There's, there's a study called the Finger Study, and there have been a few other lifestyle um, studies where, we, in this case, have been multi pronged. So people do physical activity, have a healthy diet, um, mental stimulation, social stimulation, and very careful control of their cardiovascular outcomes. Um, and with this sort of combined approach in people who had some risk factors but didn't have um, clear cut mild cognitive impairment or dementia it looks as though um, decline can be slowed. So a multifaceted lifestyle approach. Uh, it's fairly harmless as well in terms of if you want to try it yourself. Um, you, 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 can, you can do this sort of thing and it'll def definitely help your general health. The difficulty as clinicians is this is what you'll be told by your GP if you go anyway. I mean, we know that this sort of thing um, helps people, and yet people don't do it, and none of us is perfect, are, are, are we, really? So actually developing an intervention like this that people will actually do is really tricky, and we don't yet have that. We can't give out um, a recipe to people to say, go home and do this, and we know that it's going to work. If you come to our clinic, then... Um, uh, if you have mild memory problems, you might see Annika, who's sitting at the back there, who will go through your risk factors and give you some of this advice. Um, and we're looking at whether or that, that actually makes a difference. Um, we think it's probably good. It's called a brain health clinic, but we, we don't know yet. So there is some promise in terms of slowing decline using lifestyle. And then this is the, these are the treatments that we have. So if you come up, you've got, you get diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, we, there are four drugs we can give you. Three of them work in the same way. They boost a brain chemical called acetylcholine, and one of them works in a slightly different way. And these are the standard treatments, and people, on average, if, if they work, which they do about half the time, get about a two-point benefit on a 30-point memory scale. So it's not an enormous benefit, but it is something positive that we can do, and we offer them to people. And now our standard practice is you start on one of them, and then we add in the second one that works in a different way, and we try and get people on both to give the best possible quality of life. But if people get side effects, then we, 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 people often have to stop them. So not perfect, but we do have some treatment for symptoms in, the, in established dementia. Right. So what does the future look like? Well, uh, there's somebody called... Um, uh, Come, Professor Cummins, who every year or two collates all the trials, which is very handy. So this is his picture. And obviously you can't see the individual words, which we don't need to see anyway. But if you look at the middle circle, that is the phase three trial. So those are the trials um, that will report in the next two to five years. Maybe some of them might even report this year, I think. Um, and we can see that the, 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 the upper segment is disease modifying. So this is slowing decline. Um, and so is the purple segment disease modifying, and then on, on, on the orange part is symptom, treating symptoms. So we have plenty of trials that aim to disease modify. I want to make the point now that if I put this circle next to the circles for cardiovascular disease and cancer, this would shrink right down. To fit them all on the slide, this, this circle would have to shrink right down because the amount of research in dementia is, is, is vastly overwhelmed by the amount of research in cardiovascular disease and cancer. And that's probably why, if you get diagnosed with cancer, it's, you get a much more amazing focused treatment and you can really alter the outlook. But with dementia, we still have just those four drugs that give a small benefit to symptoms. So although this looks good, we have to put it in context. Right, so what are these drugs targeting? So, uh, well, um, I'm going to start at the top with amyloid. So amyloid, we know, is one of the first proteins that's found in um, Alzheimer's disease, and many of these treatments target amyloid. And it's been, um, it's been I'd say, a, a roller coaster, particularly in the last couple of years, with regard to amyloid therapies. Ten years ago, the story was that there'd been a trial of a vaccination against amyloid, and that, that had caused some neuroinflammation hadn't worked. And then there were some drug trials underway in established Alzheimer's d dementia, which didn't work. It's in I don't know if any of you have been involved in it, but when you're involved in a trial that doesn't work, it's incredibly disappointing for all the trial team and all the patients who take part. It's a huge amount of work to set up these trials and a huge amount of money, usually from the pharmaceutical industry. And then when they don't work, it is actually devastating. I mean, it was a shock to me how difficult that is to manage when you start in clinical practice running trials. So we had these trials that hadn't worked, and the idea was... Maybe we were going too late in the process. We were giving people treatment after the brain changes were irrevocable. So um, 
there's always the worry that we're using the wrong target as well. So we just put that to one side. But are we going too late? So then we had um, the most recent roller coaster ride, which was about a drug called aducanumab. So this is taken from an article, again, written by Professor Cummins. And um, it, you, this, this timeline is just to give you an idea of how long, so from 2007 to 2022, how long it's taken to get a drug that has been licensed for a few people in America. So this is the first drug to be licensed as a disease modifier for Alzheimer's disease, but only in the US at the moment as we currently uh, speak. So aducanumab targets amyloid as it begins to form clumps before it forms plaques. Um, and it had extremely promising preclinical data. So this is not mouse data, which we all know we have to be sceptical about, but this is um, data in the first-in-man type trials where it definitely, there's no doubt, after three trials, aducanumab reduces the amount of amyloid in people's brains. We can look at their PET scans and we can see that amyloid, in some cases, was removed from people's brains. So um, Biogen set up two trials because you need two trials to get, like, to get a drug approved. And they set up two phase three trials to try and show that aducanumab was going to slow progression of Alzheimer's disease. And we were, we were a site for these trials, and so was Rice in Bath, actually. Um, and, they, and they did what's called a futility analysis as the trial was running. And then they suddenly announced, we're stopping, this trial is futile. Um, and then they looked at the data again and realised that, in fact, one of the two trials had met the primary outcome. So to me, this was quite astonishing. It's the first ever time I've had a trial which has slowed progression of Alzheimer's disease according to some very clinical outcomes. So these were just asking people how you're doing every day. It slowed progression according to that clinical outcome, but only in one of two trials. But the second trial didn't ever get to the end. Neither trial got to the end. So the obvious thing, I think we'd all say, we need another trial. That's, that's what, was, that what was needed, because we hadn't had a chance to complete a trial. But what actually happened was Biogen took the drug to the American Food and Drug uh, Administration and received a license for it in the US, which was incredibly controversial. So people resigned their position on the FDA because of this. Um, and but in America, you'll know that you need to get drug um, you need to get insurance funding, and actually the insurance companies have only funded it in a, under very restricted license. So there are some people in the U.S. who can have this drug to slow progression of their Alzheimer's as part of a clinical trial. The European Medicines Agency were going to refuse, and so Biogen withdrew from Europe. It's not quite clear. MHR, our medicines agency is, is probably linked to Europe still, so we, we probably will not get this drug, I think, um, now. Uh, to me, that's quite disappointing. As a clinician, I would have prescribed it to people who could understand the risks and, and understood the fact that there were side effects from this drug and there was a modest benefit from it and there was only one trial. I would have then prescribed it if people with consent, uh, but I, I'll say that and I'll just duck behind here because there are plenty of clinicians who are adamantly opposed to giving something without proper, the full trial evidence and with this sort of side effect profile that it had. So it's really divided the field and it, we've lost a drug that we may have been okay actually. So um, I hope that doesn't happen again. But the exciting thing is that there are two other amyloid um, drugs and these drugs work as antibodies targeting the amyloid and they work in a fairly similar way and those trials we'll learn about in, over the next months to years. So we may have a drug that, w that works. We're looking, so to say with the drug that works, it slows decline by about 20%. Um, so it's, it's not curing Alzheimer's for people as far as we know, but it is slowing decline. And th th that is an exciting step forward. So amyloid, possibly. Tau correlates better, as we heard earlier, correlates better with how people actually are. So your tau spreading through your brain actually um, is more associated with how you are day to day. Um, I'm going to talk about, so there are some antibodies to tau, just like the, to amyloid, and, and, and one of them just hasn't worked actually, but there are others. Um, but I'm going to talk about another way of, um, of, give, of treating people, because I think it's really exciting. So, I don't know if you've heard, but there is a neurodegenerative condition that we can actually treat. 
It's, it's the first one that we've been able to treat. So it's called spinal muscular atrophy. It's really rare. It's completely different to dementia, but it is a neurodegenerative condition. Um, it usually presents within the first six months of life. It's a catastrophic, tragic illness where people life expectancy is about two. Uh, people lo lose their motor milestones and um, lose their respiratory function. They can't breathe. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing to happen. Anyway, um, there is now a treatment. And it's extremely expensive. It costs about half a million pounds a year. Um, and um, it works in a really clever way. So um, when you make every protein in your cell, your bodies, um, DNA in the center of the cell makes something called RNA, which then makes protein. Um, and if you've got a problem with one of those proteins, um, what, what, we, what this this drug does is it goes in and binds onto the RNA and stops production of that abnormal protein. It has to be given through lumbar puncture. So we now have clinics in our centre for these patients who come up, have a lumbar puncture, have an injection of this drug, and it um, binds to their RNA, stops them producing this abnormal protein, and People, I mean, we've only been able to do this for a few years. People look like they're having normal lives. Children are developing and that they're not dying. And so it, it's transformative. And it's now being given in the adult. The reason why it's done in our centre, which is an adult centre, is it can be given for adult spinal muscular atrophy, which is a milder version. So um, this is a new technology. It's an amazing new technology. You do have to have a lumbar puncture, but you don't have to have it drug every day. You can have it every three months or so. Um, so... There's been a first in man trial, and these data, um, um, yes, this trial's led partially as a clinician by a called Kath Mummery in, in, in London, um, and she has been injecting people with uh, um, an antisense oligonucleotide, so one of these little um, uh, substances that goes in and it binds to the RNA and stops the tau protein being produced. And... This graph, haven't got many graphs, so you'll be pleased to hear, but this graph um, shows that the black line is um, the level of tau, this sticky protein, in people who have um, received placebo. So that's the way we do trials. Half the people get placebo, half the people get a drug. And people who re receive placebo, their tau levels stay the same. In people who receive this drug, tau levels are reduced. So, looks now like with amyloid, we know that we can reduce tau using this drug. Um, that looks very exciting. The, the drug will go to a larger trial, I'm sure. Um, massive caveat. We had graphs looking just like this for a similar drug in Huntington's disease. Um, and when they actually did the full trial, it, the, these benefits did not translate into clinical benefits. And there's been a lot of investigation into why that didn't happen. And it might be that they did the injections every month and that produced a sort of autoimmune reaction and some sort of inflammation. So here it's really heartening is that the, um, the two high-dose arms, one was done every three months and one was done every month and you got a pretty, so these are the, the blue and purple here, you get a pretty similar response. So um, I, I'm guessing that the big trial is going to help have people having injections every three months to try and avoid any of your body trying to reject the substance or anything like that. But we don't actually know for sure that that's why the Huntington's trial didn't work. We, so this may work, but we may end up being disappointed again. So we have to be really careful. Right, so a summary of amyloid and tau is that I think... I see what the others think, uh, other things, but I think we're probably going to see an agent in the next few years. It's probably not going to be curative, but it probably will slow decline. It's probably going to be very, very expensive. There are going to be huge discussions about who can receive it and who can't. Um, but, but I imagine we're going to we're, we're going to see a drug. In the last five minutes, I'm just going to talk about other targets. So. Recently, there's been a lot of interest in neuroinflammation. Inflammation is when you scratch yourself, the redness around it. Um, so it's same in the brain when there's damage, such as the start of amyloid plaques, you, your body responds to that. And there's an idea that the way that your body responds to the intrusion of one of these proteins will define um, whether or not it just gets removed or whether or not it becomes a chronic issue. And there's quite a lot of evidence to support that. Um, there's a drug that's in a trial underway to try and modify the way that your body responds. 
Um, but something we're doing um, it's one of the things that's been associated with neuroinflammation at post-mortem is um, a bacterium called P. gingivalis, um, and that comes from your teeth. Uh, so the idea is if, if we can remove this, people with gum disease have more of this bacteria, if we can remove this um, bacteria from your mouth, um, can we stop it getting into your brain? And actually, we've got some funding to look at this, and we've got a feasibility trial that we're just setting up now to see if we can improve dental hygiene. And again, it's one of those things where it's not going to do any harm. It's probably going to benefit you to have better dental hygiene anyway. Um, and there's just an outside chance that it might help with your brain health as well. Diabetic agents, so Ivan can tell you a bit more about this, but they look quite promising. Uh, Liraglutide a trial we did, um, uh, led by Imperial, uh, where it looked that taking a diabetic agent uh, helps boost memory and thinking, although it didn't, um, it didn't meet the... It actually was just intended to improve the, the use of glucose on a PET scan, uh, but it didn't do that, but it did help with memory and thinking. And then I just couldn't help mentioning sleep. So it looks like there's an optimum duration for brain, an optimum sleep duration for brain health. So um, looking at the, an enormous cohort, the UK Biobank, looking at people who sleep for between six and eight hours, that they perform better on cognitive tests. And these big orange areas of brain here are generally bigger if you sleep between six and eight hours as opposed to longer or shorter. Um, what does that mean for our patients? Um, well, uh, that, well, we could, we could aim to get people sleeping between six and eight hours, but we might be missing something because during that six and eight hour period, you're not just passively resting, you're, um, you're cycling through a set of processes that start with light sleep and then proceed to deeper sleep. And during this deep sleep period is when you have these slow oscillations. So your whole brain is synchronized, oscillating um, at a rate of about once per second. And uh, during that time, there's some quite good evidence that you're filtering out some of the proteins that cause problems that cause Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's also a time when you lay down memories. So those, those, those commu that electrical communication every second helps to fix memories across your whole brain. So that's really important, that slow wave sleep, deep sleep. Unfortunately, none of us knows. If you asked me last night, did you have good slow wave sleep? Got no idea. <laughs> and it's, it might be linked to sleep duration, but it's, we don't know. So um, there are lots of ways we can think about improving slow wave sleep. Um, including even rocking at the right, uh, the right rate, and these are all experimental, or playing sound at the right rate. But one thing we really have to think about is with our increasingly obese population, more people have sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is sort of associated with snoring. So when people have pauses in snoring, they try and breathe, but the upper airway shuts down. And so people can't breathe, and they have big, long the oxygen levels drop, and they have long pauses in breathing. Um, if you have sleep apnea and you're having 20 of those sort of um, apnea, those, those difficulties breathing every hour, you never get into slow wave sleep. You never get those slow oscillations that help to filter processes. So one of the things, one of the, in sleep, one of the things we can really start to think about is do our patients have sleep apnea? Should we be treat, treating that? How should we treat it? We can treat it with a CPAP mask. Um, so, uh, but, you know, do patients tolerate this? We can also treat it by getting people sometimes to lie on their side. Some people only have it in certain positions. So there's all sorts of ways we can think about it and what's best to do in people with dementia or mild cognitive impairment. We don't know the answer to that yet. Um, but treating sleep looks quite promising, I think. Uh, right, so there are some anti-epileptic drugs, blood pressure drugs. There are trials going on to try and repurpose. So that's the quickest way is to get a drug to market, is to take something we already know is safe and repurpose it. And, and, and we've been involved in some of that effort. Dietary, the, so the, the Mediterranean diet, and also omega-3 um, dietary additives, there are trials underway of those. And also treating hearing loss as a trial underway, uh, managing anxiety and depression, and increasing physical activity. All these are trials that are going on to try and help uh, slow or prevent um, dementia. So... This is very short to say, what is, what, what is the future, what does the future hold? What's our new approach? 
So when you come up to clinic and you have memory problems, what should be happening? Well, this is what I think should be happening, is that we should really understand you. We should understand the genetic cause of your problem, the molecular pathology that you have. We should understand your lifestyle, what would work for you, your daily behaviour, what, 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 what your wake and sleep rhythms are like, whether you can breathe overnight, whether, whether you have um, markers of epilepsy. We should understand all of this, and then you should have a personalised, bespoke programme to try and, if you don't have dementia, reduce your risk of dementia, and if you do, treat the underlying cause and also the symptoms. And I hope that in the next 10 to 20 years, this is the approach that we will take. And there are loads of strides, including something called the Dementia Research Institute, which we're not in. I'm not in. You might be. I'm not sure. But um, we're not in. Uh, but they've got some really amazing technology um, research looking at how we can monitor people and try and improve life and that, how that can be put into everybody's homes and lives. So, again, if you're interested in <laughs> any research, please get in touch with us or join Dementia Research. Uh, Victoria's at the back, and this is our group who have helped do some of the research that we do. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. We've had uh, several questions online, but first one, is sleep deprivation a specific instance of generic deprivation, and does deprivation of any sort impact on dementia? Um, so I think sleep deprivation is different to, for example, social deprivation. Is that, is that, is that what, yeah, okay. Uh, um, yes, and um, there are huge health inequalities, including in dementia. So people who take part in research tend to be better educated and more well off and people who um, dementia is under recognized in some communities people who don't in our, in England who don't who don't have um, in English as a first language so there, there there's a huge impact of social deprivation also if we look at management of risk factors like blood pressure in midlife people who are most likely to go and get their blood pressure sorted out are people who have the facility to do that, um, have the support, the social support, and that's often people um, with, with sort of um, sort of sort of higher social groups who can do that. So um, I th yes, there's a, I think sleep deprivation is separate. Although, actually, having a quiet, dark place to sleep is a luxury that not everybody has. So they are linked. Okay, um, and a question: If a protein is found. Does it mean that it was not there before? That is such a hard question. <laughs> so, um, so uh, some of these proteins. <laughs> so, some of these proteins are clearly abnormal. So, um, I don't think there's a normal situation where you would expect to have the A B to forty two, which is the, the abnormal form of uh, amyloid. Interestingly, phospho tau may be produced in neonates as well. So there may be a sort of lifespan fluctuation of phospho tau as cells break down at various points in life. So um, I think that's a hard question. <laughs> well, one last quick one then, and we'll, we'll, we'll go and move on to Sarah's talk. Uh, if sleep is so important, should as bad sleepers take sleeping pills? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I didn't mention sleeping pills. You might have heard NICE guidelines recently have changed that even for insomnia, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy is prioritised ahead of um, sleeping pills. There's been some epidemiological data which has linked the sort of hypnotic pills uh, to increased rates of dementia. Um, I, my reading of that is that's probably because as you go through the Alzheimer's process, you start to sleep badly. We know that sleep is impaired by Alzheimer's as well as potentially causing Alzheimer's. So um, you start to sleep badly as part of the process, so then, then you have a hypnotic, and then, and then it looks as though the hypnotic is linked to Alzheimer's. But I'm not an epidemiologist, so I'll allow other people to comment on that more precisely. Uh, but I'd say I would, sleeping tablets are there, sometimes they're needed, but I wouldn't do that unless it's absolutely essential. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can I ask one question? Yeah, sure. Right. Uh, when I worked in a community pharmacy, I noticed that a great many of our older customers, particularly la older ladies, bought paracetamol and they said, I take it to help me sleep. And I actually do that now. I find that if I take one paracetamol when I go to bed, I get a better night's sleep. And I wondered if anybody had looked at the links. 
No, but I will be now. Uh, so, uh, so no, I don't know why. Is that because of pain or because? Okay. So interestingly, and, and as, not, I don't know the answer to that, but it's very interesting because that's a safe drug. So yes, well, I'll have a look at that. That's interesting. Um, it, also, progesterone in um, HRT. So progesterone helps sleep. It's been shown to help sleep, but HRT is never given in, with a d defined time of day. So I think there are things that we can probably do quite easily to help sleep for certain groups um, like that, but I didn't know the paracetamol thing. Okay. Sorry, that we had a lot of customers, you know, say particularly older ladies, who were buying um, usually soluble paracetamol, and that they said, you know, because we had to then say to them, don't take more than four in a day and all, all that, you know, eight in a day. Mm -hmm. And they would say, oh, I just take one at night to help me sleep. Right, thank you. <laughs> That's a new trial, thank you. Okay. Like we're going to have a Q&A &A session at the end where we're going to bring everybody, everybody back in. We, we also have a, a backlog of questions online as well, so we'll, we'll do our best to go through, through all of them. Uh, but thanks very much to Liz for, uh, for managing to uh, do a very impressive talk on a, on a, on a, on a topic that's difficult to summarise. Uh, because, as she said, there's a lot of things happening. Now, the, the final uh, talk uh, that we're going to have before a tea break and then this Q&A session uh, will be from my colleague Sarah, Sarah Bauermeister. She's a senior scientist and a senior data manager for, for DP UK, for Dementia's Platform UK. So if there's anything that can be known about how to analyse data sets and where to find them, it's Sarah that we turn to. So, Sarah, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Ivan, and thank you for this invitation. So, I think John has often said I'm at the coalface of DPUK. So, in other words, I work very much with the data that is collected from everyone's uh, uh, participation, and thank you on um, DPUK's behalf for all your participation um, in this valuable research and for all the data it produces for us as researchers and scientists to analyze, to produce hopefully good science towards um, producing treatments and new discoveries for dementia. Um, so I will move on. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, the data portal, which John referred to very early in his talk, and also about cohort data, which is collected, and industry and academic partnerships, which work very much together to produce the research outcomes using these valuable data sets, and also how we at DPUK work to produce training for researchers working on these data sets to produce scientific outcomes towards um, looking at new treatments for dementia. So it's a whole research life cycle that I'm going to hopefully briefly go over in 20 minutes. So this is Dementia's Platform UK on the left-hand side, our website. This is where researchers can come and have a look at DPUK's website and see about everything that we do and how they can find out about perhaps funding, information, and even about great minds. And on the left-hand side, this is the data portal. So this is the data portal where researchers will come along to find out how they can access the data sets which you participate in to create these data sets. So they come along and they can apply for the data set. So we have over 50 um, cohorts in the data portal across three and a half million individuals. So researchers submit a project proposal to, with a research question and come and um, interrogate these data sets with their research question. Their proposal then gets approved and they then gain access to these data sets. So first of all, we give them tools and directories to come and have a look at which type of data sets they, they need to answer their questions. So across 50 data sets, not all of these data sets are appropriate. So perhaps they want to look at Airwave, but they need ALSPAC. So we give them a choice of their data sets and they have a look. Perhaps they want to look at lifestyle, Perhaps they want to look at sociodemographic data. So we provide all the tools for our 
our researchers and directories with all the information about what type of data have been collected on individuals such as yourselves so they know to apply for the appropriate data. This goes out to our cohort owners and then our cohort owners approve access to these data sets and then the researchers can then be given access to the data on our data portal. They don't download the data, we give them actually a virtual desktop with all the tools for them to analyse the data sets. And this is the application form that they fill in that we then process for these researchers. And the researchers come from both industry and academia across the world. And as John showed you this morning, the, uh, we have actually over a thousand applicants across all of our cohorts. So this is really a successful model that is reaching researchers across the world because this is a free to access resource that is really democratizing data access for all researchers with questions as broad as looking at early adversity to perhaps the influence of hormones on cognitive decline towards dementia across the lifespan. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about our cohort data and the data which is in our data portal. So this is the breadth of the data across our um, different cohorts. We have over 18 broad categories of data across our cohorts. And as you can see, our cohorts have data on physical examination, imaging, psychological status, cognition, lifestyle, and you will know yourselves that this is some of the data that you contribute to and device-derived phenotypes. And below these categories, there is perhaps another 140 subcategories, and these, these categories grow and grow. Some of our cohorts have half a million individuals in, and some of these um, co uh, cohorts have just perhaps a couple of hundred participants in. So um, each of our cohorts are very purpose specific. Some of our cohorts, for example, have collected data perhaps on cancer, and some of our cohorts are healthy birth cohorts. But it doesn't matter what the cohorts originally collected the data for, they are all being repurposed for dementia research. So the cohorts have come to us and said they are willing to entrust their data set for dementia's research. And that is what is important from a DPUK's point of view. And so some of the challenges that DPUK face is that all of these data sets come to us and they are very heterogeneous. They have been collected at source in various styles, various formats, and also each variable is named in a different way. This is a real example of one variable collected across three of our cohorts. And the variable is, have you ever had a pain in your chest? One cohort has named it F underscore 059. One cohort named it HERA. One cohort named it 6015. So one service that DPUK are undertaking over the next few years is to standardize the naming structure of these variables so that it says ever had pain in the chest into just 12 characters. And what this will do is make it easier for analysts to uh, compare these research data sets with each other and analyze them. And so instead of having one data set of say 200 people, they can take three data sets of 200, 10,000, 5,000, combine them together and make an even more powerful calculation. So this is the work that DPUK and we are, are undertaking and we are investing a lot of time into standardizing the naming structure of our um, cohort variables. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit about the projects that are being undertaken by researchers across the world working together with industry and academic uh, research groups. Now, this is a very positive um, message, I hope, and this is a project called the Super Ages Project. And this is being um, sponsored by DPUK and also one of our industry partners, Five Lives. 
And what we're looking at is the characteristics of adults aged 85 and 90 who are cognitively healthy still at 85 and 90. And as you saw in some of the presentations this morning is that we really want to understand that those years, 20 and 30 years, before someone comes into the clinic with perhaps a memory complaint. Because what we need to know is, what did they eat 20 years before? How physically active were they? Did they smoke? How much schooling did they have? But by the time they come into the clinic, it's, it's almost, well, they're just a snapshot when they're in the clinic. But the strength of cohort data is we've already collected it, so we can go back and understand those characteristics of these healthy individuals. Now, this project is doing just that. We've got five cohorts across 10,000, 5,000, 21,000, 1 million, and 12,000 individuals. And what we're doing is we are looking at these characteristics. And so we're looking at their medical history, we're looking at psychological status, lifestyle, physical environment, social environment, and physical examination. So we're going to look at, did they have hearing loss? Have they ever lost lo um, consciousness over their lifespan? Did they have low mood? How was their sleep quality? And how many units of alcohol did they drink? And um, were they living in a physical environment where there was noise pollution? Did they go clubbing? And did they have a good childhood environment? So what we're doing is we're bringing together all these characteristics and we're starting to understand what is a healthy adult at 90 years old and they're simply really healthy and cognitively intact. And so perhaps once we understand these healthy adults, we will then start to understand um, more about dementia progression. So how do we do this statistically? So this is a, a little diagram to show you. So we look at different time points across the lifespan. So this is an example of, say, one of our cohorts that has four different collection points. So we will then look at time point one, two, three, and four, and we'll look at a measure that has been measured exactly the same across four time points. We'll look at the relationship between time point one, two, and two and three and three and four. But importantly, we will look at the relationship between that variable at time point one, so their memory at time point one and their memory at time point four. And then we will see these super ages and we will look at the characteristics of this small group that were super ages compared to all the rest across these four different time points. So statistically, this is how we will actually get to this small group of individuals. And this work we are busy undertaking right now. Another piece of work that we're, be, we're uh, undertaking, also uh, sponsored by DPUK and run out of Oxford, is looking at life course stress and brain health. And for this work, we're looking at early adversity and biopsychosocial outcomes. And so we're working with researchers in Romania, Switzerland, Ireland, USA, Brazil, Israel, Uganda, and Five Lives, again, our industry partner. And we're looking at people who've experienced deprivation and child abuse when they were much younger. Because unfortunately, an adverse childhood can lead to, is associated with perhaps later life um, depression and even dementia, cardiometabolic disease and even morbidity. And so for this project, which is a very large program of work, it has been going on for the last two years and will carry on for the next three years, we are looking at over 16 cohorts across DP UK and also cohorts which we are bringing into DP UK. And the idea with this um, project is, again, we go back to the longitudinal diagram. 
We're looking at, for example, early adversity self-reported in 1989. And then we're also looking at people's mental health and cognition in 1989, again in 99, 2009, and 2015. And what we found is that people who've reported early adversity um, back in 1989, it is affecting their uh, mental health and cognition even 23 years later. And so what we're trying to understand is why this happens and what the effect is um, on their mental health and cognition. But again, to take home, and this is the statistical model that we're working with, and just to show you that this is what the analysts work with um, and how they do it. But just to take home a positive note is that despite chronic and severe adversity, some children are unaffected by this trajectory. And what we're trying to do in Oxford is look at how we can understand a resilience risk scale. And by developing a program which looks at the environment, cognition, brain structure, mental health, endocrine, and genetic factors, by developing a resilience risk tool, we can identify those at risk of adverse effects and we can develop a program, policy, prevention, and perhaps intervention of those at risk. So this program of work is ongoing in collaboration with industry and academia. So training, I've been shown, I've only got a couple of minutes, but I'm nearly done. We have datathons and academies for both industry and academic uh, researchers. So what we want to do is upskill and train researchers all over the world to use our valuable research resources so that we can do good science to develop new treatments and new discovery for um, dementia. And we have datathons where researchers can come along and attend a workshop, collaborate together, and practice new skills on cohort data. We, we provide mentoring and training for our researchers. And we have a spring academy, we have an autumn academy for advanced analytic skills. And as John showed this diagram as well, we are branching out to um, South Africa and Africa during this year. And we really hope that this will build up the new generation of early career researchers so that we can push forward new discoveries for dementia. And this is a real life picture of one of our very happy early career researchers. Thank you. Have we got any questions for Sarah? Okay, this may be a bit unfair for you, Sarah, but uh, from online, uh, Davina McCall announced in her menopause program that HRT slowed or prevented onset of dementia. Where can I source reliable research in regard to this to back my request for H HRT? About HRT? Yeah. Um, well, I think that um, perhaps if, uh, I would be happy to be contacted. Um, I can also say that I have a project underway at the moment looking at estrogen and testosterone and life course effect on cognition. So I'd be very happy to be contacted and perhaps I can find out more information. Okay, and you covered this to a certain extent, but have there been any studies on how comorbidities affect dementia? Yes, there, there are a lot of um, studies on comorbidities and how that affects um, uh, dementia. And comorbidities are in, uh, an incredi incredibly important factor. And I think that dementia is not an isolated um, factor on its own at all, as I think as we've seen today in our presentations. It's, uh, yes. Thank you. And Radio 4 this morning mentioned a connection between hearing loss and dementia. I'm in this category. Can I be of help in further research? Um, indeed. So um, my own work in hearing loss, um, we're hoping to uh, seek funding this year for a clinical trial and we will be using great minds to recruit to this trial. So uh, watch this space, that's all I can say. 
Thank you, Sarah. In which case, I think we'll have another quick break now and then we'll come back for the, the, the panel session, if that's okay. Back in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Great talks from everyone uh, and for some very insightful questions that, you know, you saw us visibly struggle with some of them. Uh, <laughs> hopefully we can continue in that vein. Um, so we've got questions that are left over uh, that we couldn't, we couldn't answer. Uh, so I'm happy to go through them. Uh, but in the meantime, are there any questions from the room to, to kickstart? One at the back. I have um, dyslexia and dyspraxia. And when I do the cognitive tests, I always come up with a spiky profile. I wondered if that's taken into account when um, actually diagnosing people that anyone who's got any kind of neurodiverse thinking. Sure. I think that's, uh, it, that's probably a question for the clinicians. Liz, do you, how, do you, how do you approach this? I think it's quite difficult the first time that you um, test somebody because you see their cognitive profile, but obviously you don't know how they were when they were 25. Um, we try and estimate what's within normal range. And the first, we often have to repeat the test. And if someone has something like Alzheimer's disease, they'll get worse over time. Um, sometimes you see such a typical pattern for Alzheimer's disease that, we, that, that we, we don't need to repeat it. But if it's a slightly unusual profile that would be in keeping with neurodiversity, then we wouldn't read, we wouldn't think that that was pathological or signs of a disease. We'd just um, think that we had to repeat the test. We'd also look around for other evidence of problems so we in our clinic we do biomarkers we look to see if someone's got amyloid or tau in their csf if we if we really think there is a problem but the cognitive tests can't be used yeah. but but in a sense also as part of the dementia uh, assessment that we do clinically we do ask questions about how how this person has functioned all their life so it's not just a snapshot of of what's happened in the past two weeks but you also get a sense of how has schooling been have there any been any particular issues and and these types of problems tend to come out in, in that sort of conversation. But I guess it, this touches back on, on a conversation we had one during one of the coffee breaks, is that the digital technology that I was talking about, it, this is where really it will come into, into its own, is allowing for people, as, as data gets collected, to actually create a profile of who they are cognitively in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s, so that by the time you get to 60 or 70, you can see, you know, is this a, is, is the way that they are now a, a difference to how, to what we expect for, for this particular person, rather than comparing it to some imaginary average person, because in the future we'll know so much about people uh, using these devices. Uh, will be able to, to, to really take those individual factors into consideration. Good. I think it also refers to a growing awareness of the limitations in cognitive testing tools. And once you are more aware of the limitations, then you devise a next generation of tools which address those limitations. And uh, as Ivan was mentioning, with sort of the, if you like, the digital world, our ability to test more specific issues or more specific cognitive domains uh, more fairly uh, grows rapidly. Uh, so I completely accept the point that you know, many of the tests now are insensitive to neurodiversity, but I expect over the next five, ten years that those issues will be addressed. One question online before... Yeah, well, actually, carry on. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's hear from you. Thinking about that, is this, sorry, is this something which perhaps could be set up outside the NHS? I can't see how the NHS could manage testing every 50-year-old for their level of Alzheimer's, say, and then test them again after five years and after 10 years. I, so I think, I'm wondering whether yes. this is perhaps something which should be set up outside the NHS. Yeah, if you know what I, I, mean. I think this, uh, there's more, there is going to be more than one solution to this, but the, the, the real rate limiting factor is the efficiency of the testing tool. So for example, if you need to have an interview, that's very inefficient because it takes up valuable and expensive clinician time. If you have to travel to a centre, that's very inefficient because it takes your time you know, to go there and back. 
I think the ideal is to be able to do this testing uh, in the home, um, or at least on the person. Uh, so, for example, I get sent an app every so often which asks me various personal questions, which I'm not going to repeat now. Um, um, but the point is it's really convenient, you know, five minutes, yeah, done. So I expect there to be cognitive testing regimes uh, which you can complete at home, which will be uh, very informative, which will be done frequently, so trajectories will be assessed. And that information will then be available to the, to the NHS doctors at minimal cost. Just, just, I mean, there are, there are multiple companies um, developing online or, or app-based cognitive tests, and we're working with some of them. I think the difficulty is going to be deciding which one we should standardise. And we don't want the same thing to happen as has happened with cognitive tests, is that each centre kind of uses their own set, which makes it very difficult to generalise. So hopefully we'll come up with a national plan for that. Great. Um, one recurring question slash topic that is coming in online is about the screening, uh, the, the possibility for a screening for dementia and whether uh, it, we're ready to, to, to have a, a screening program. I wonder whether the, the panel have, a, have any particular views about A, how far away is it, how far away it is and what conditions would need to be met in order to, for this thing to get off the ground? Well, <laughs> John looks if like there was up. ever a tricky question, that was it. Um, my expectation is that the diagnosis of um, pathology for dementia will become increasingly molecular. Uh, and uh, that means that it won't be a matter of uh, screening for symptoms, it'll be a matter of identifying risk. And then once you identify risk, then you're in a position to decide on preventive treatments. So that's where I see it going at a population level. Uh, meanwhile, of course, there will be the different stages of, of treatments that Liz uh, describes so well. But the problem with that, as Ivan has said, is that no screening procedure is perfect. Now, you will get false positives. You have a problem when you don't have a problem and you will get false negatives. Oh, you're fine. Actually, you're not fine. Uh, and uh, trying to minimise that overlap is exceedingly difficult, which is why I think we're going to actually go f to molecular uh, measures. I, I, I completely agree. We're going, to do we're going to be doing molecular identification of Alzheimer's disease. I mean, we can almost do that now. And whether or not we have screening will depend on what treatments are available. I mean, and, that, and until we have effective treatments that can be implemented at scale, there's, there's not going to be a case for screening. Uh, because in terms of lifestyle measures, they're good for you anyway. So people should probably do them anyway. Not that I do. But <laughs> good. One question for the epidemiologists among us is whether there's any studies currently looking at potential, uh, the potential effect of pollution and air quality on dementia. Uh, it's certainly that's something that's been in the news. I don't know whether... Um, there, there, there are data available, uh, and I, I think they are being analysed. Um, I'm not aware of the findings. Yeah. I've, I've certainly come across a paper where they, they did a reasonably good job at um, essentially correcting for, for the sort of things that air pollution goes with, because it, the, the, the critical issue with epidemiological research, and, and of course Sarah and, and John can, uh, can speak more about this, is that a, a risk factor that you, you think is important, for example air pollution, happens to, uh, to co-occur with a lot of other things which may also uh, be causing the, the problem. So, air, you know, poor air pollution, you know, in, if you take the case of air pollution, it's likely that this is also a place where there's there's more noise. So it could be that it's the noise that's causing it rather than the pollution. It, it, it will typically be in an area that's a bit more deprived. So it's conceivable that it will be um, that, that it will be deprivation. It could be that it's an area where people come in and out um, more, more frequently because it's more busy and that in, introduces a confound. 
but yeah, I guess the bigger question is how, how do you disentangle these things when you approach, uh, for example, Sarah, when you approach a, a research question, you've identified this thing which is going to bring you the Nobel Prize, um, but you know it's it's linked to all of these other factors that could explain it. How do you how do you approach that? Um, with, with great difficulty, actually. So usually uh, with something like pollution, so for example, the large cohort UK Biobank, they have measured, for example, um, air pollution. And so when you're looking at that, you quite rightly say you have to look at factors such as housing density. And once you look at housing density, how many people are living in the house, then you have to start looking at things like income, um, socioeconomic status, and so if you look at, for example, um, housing density, well, students all live together. So just because you've got 10 people in the house doesn't mean to say there is low socioeconomic status. It's just because they are students, and so they're all living in the house. So it's really difficult as an analyst to start unpicking the factors. So as an analyst, you actually become a detective, and it's a lot of detective work because if you're not careful, suddenly you're associating minor factors such as, I don't know, wearing sun cream with air pollution, which is just not associated at all. So it is detective work. Mm. I, I think this raises a question of uh, how committed we are as a society to research because ultimately the, the, the answer lies in scale. Uh, you need d data at scale. You need data on hundreds of thousands of people over decades. Now, with those sorts of data, then actually you, you do have enough statistical power to tease out the effect of each small con contributor. But you can't do it on, on studies of 2,000 or studies of 5,000. Uh, and we as a society need to invest in these large studies because the the return to us, the benefic beneficial return to us, will be substantial. Yeah, question in the room. Hello, it's, it's just briefly saying, um, commenting on what you just said, but going back to what somebody said earlier about can the NHS um, afford this? If, if we can screen every woman in the country for breast cancer, etc., and hopefully offer it to, to men as well as prostrate, then yes, we most certainly can s start screening people for dementia earlier. And one thing nobody's touched on at all is the fact when you know you've got dementia, you have to plan the rest of your life. You have to change your lifestyle and you have to have a really strong relationship with somebody if you're fortunate enough to have a partner. And so it is important that people are diagnosed early uh, because you can do preventative things. So research is vital on all sorts of patterns. And for, for a family, it's as important, I would say, as cancer. Yeah. So just just to say, okay, we we completely agree to the, agree with that, and we are very committed to that. And we offer early diagnosis, so we offer the molecular biomarkers. And what we need to hear is is that from you, because we also hear from actually mainly other doctors uh, that early diagnosis is not warranted in the face of when we haven't got treatments and it is a controversial area offering early diagnosis. So we could, in theory, now look for Alzheimer's in people without symptoms, but we never do that. Um, uh, we, we actually are very careful in who we select for biomarker testing and that they've got symptoms that look like Alzheimer's, so we, don't, we do not do screening. But the, I think the, the, the powerful voice in this is patients and, and the public. If, if, if you say that early diagnosis is helpful, that will help us to deliver it. There's a stigma attached to dementia, isn't there? Because it's a neurological it's not a mental health disease, and that's a challenge. And unless we start doing more PR on what dementia really is, as alongside your research, then people shy away from it. They do not understand dementia. They believe dementia is somebody who can't speak, can't, you know. That there's a stage to it all. And I think 
for the public, the general public, to understand more about what dementia is would be massively helpful too. Yeah, and th there's some been great ambassadors uh, for, for dementia research that have really come to the fore in the, in the past couple of years. But what you said is, is perhaps super, is, 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 I know it to be super important about the, the importance of, uh, of the impact that this, this, this condition has on the, on the partners and the carers. It is, in fact, the most taxing condition uh, to be looking after that. It, you know, it outscales, you know, you know, terminal conditions and, and cancers. Uh, and it has a very significant effect on, on the carers. So we need to be thinking about these, these people who, who, you know, do the, do the right thing and, and, and do the responsible thing. And then they look after their loved ones. Um, but it, it is, you know, the early diagnosis helps immensely. Uh, with with you know because these people you know they're they're sort of you know saints but at the same time we need to help them to 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 prepare because the more prepared you are about this challenge the, the the easier it the easier it will be even though you know as I say it's 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 a it's a fantastic challenge Simon um, you so sorry can I just add, add to that I, I think the big PR uh, uh, destigmatization um, opportunity is looking at brain health. So we're familiar now with not so much <coughs> treating a heart attack as preventing one mm -hmm. through uh, lifestyle changes uh, to promote heart health. It's exactly the same principle. You know, and it's not just cognitive brain health, it's emotional brain. You now the brain is the brain, it does all of these things. And so to uh, just look into, to, sorry, to investigate how to promote brain health, how to engage society in promoting brain health, how to help individuals take on responsibility, ownership of their brain health, I think would go a long way to destigmatizing dementia. Simon, before we uh, get to the next question in the hall, I want to make sure that I give voice to the people online. Um, one question is, uh, you know, given that the future for a lot of condition is holistic assessment leading to personalized treatment, uh, the question is whether uh, perhaps this, this isn't the route for, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. We, we sort of touched on this, but, you know, it, just as a broad topic, you know, what does personalized treatment for Alzheimer's and dementia look like in an ideal world? Or, or where, where should we be in terms of personalized treatment? I think the, the, the first um, stage, wait, no, I, I don't know how it's going to look because we don't have it yet, but the first stage I think will to be identified the stage of somebody's symptoms um, so, and, and then what pathology they have. So we talked about two proteins, but there's actually a whole host of other problems that can affect the brain, including vascular problems. Um, if people have an amyloid predominant problem, we could use an amyloid drug, but it's very likely we could combine that perhaps with a vascular agent or an anti-diabetic agent to try and prevent vascular change. Um, if people, uh, there are people who have just one of those proteins, amyloid or tau, and not both, and we, pro we probably should target the protein that they actually have. Um, and it personalizes also what's acceptable to somebody. So somebody will, some people will accept a, um, a, a relatively intensive treatment regime um, requiring infusions coming up to the hospital with, with, with risk attached and some people will not don't want that even if it gives them a longer life so we have to personalize according to what people want in their lives so that's, that's the start yeah. anyway yeah thanks um, one thing that's recurring from from people online is how do we expand research to areas of the country that are, are perhaps not not close enough to, to large academic centres like Bristol, Oxford or London, uh, Kent and uh, Canterbury were given as an example. Um, I'd say that certainly what we're doing at Great Minds caters for some of that uh, because you, you can register to be a volunteer and then you get offered research that's happening local to you, locally to you. But, you know, a part of what we've learned through COVID is that a lot of the research can be done remotely. So we're certainly at least half of the study that we're supporting. You can do you can do from home. So I'd say certainly joining a research register like this, you know, definitely op opens up these possibilities. Simon, you had you had a question here in the. Um, Sarah, you were talking about um, 
the complication and the confusion of different bits of data, like people living in large households and socioeconomic status and how difficult it was to separate those out or put them together. Can you use worldwide data from other cultures where those things may be common, but, but it, for different reasons? Uh, I noticed there was a big blob on India, and they've generally got a younger population have they, have they, than we have. But other, other cultures have different ways yes. of living, different... Sarah, I'm, I'm, I think the, the question, you may just want to repeat the question for people online because I, I don't think it was, it was very audible. We, we heard you well, but I think... Yes, indeed. So, um, in other words, housing density in uh, one population such as in UK data sets might not be exactly the same as housing density in populations in Africa compared to Australia, compared to India, for example. And um, exactly. And we've just recently undertaken an exercise called harmonization. And this is where you start to compare the definition of um, housing density by different populations. And we actually have a postdoc at the moment working on a data set from India. And um, as, you, as you quite rightly mentioned, in India, you have multiple generations living under one roof, and typically there'll be 10 people. And uh, when you work with data sets, it's very important to take this into consideration, where what is absolutely normal within a population in India would not be quite so, and I say normal in a very vague um, sense of the word, is very different in the UK. And these are all factors that you take into consideration when working with data. And it's the same with um, something like education. I once worked in a hospital up uh, in Leeds, actually, and a, a lady actually from India, she had, for example, two years of education, but she was very well educated. But in India, that was normal for someone from her region. But for us to say that person is not educated because in the UK you're not, that is incorrect. So suddenly you have to define um, it totally differently. So it's, it, um, as I said before, it's, it's an investigative approach and a detective approach as how do you define different categories of uh, data. Yeah. We, I don't know if that answered your question or whether that was a very long-winded way of saying it. <laughs> we, have a, we have an interesting question here. I'm sure, I'm sure John will have a view. Um, David Jones is asking, he's saying lifestyle is important to many pathologies. Is it possible that NHS primary care can be convinced to capture such patient characteristics for the benefit of research? And if we unpack this a little bit, John, it's about you know, how do we make healthcare system work for research uh, in a way that is, if you like, going back to, to the thing you were talking about, how, how research needs to be, a, if you like, a societal priority. And, you know, what would the healthcare system's participation in this look like? Or, or what are the barriers? Or why, why are they not doing it now? Or are they? Okay. So, Ivan is correct. I do have a view on this. <laughs> um, the biggest barrier to scientific progress is access to data. Full stop period. Accessing primary care data is exceptionally difficult because the data are controlled by the primary care practices and they have very diverse policies about who they will allow to access the data or not. This means that effectively researchers by and large do not get access and when they do it's by very onerous procedures which themselves limit the access. So for example, if I wanted to link my uh, research cohort data from DPUK, we have at least 30 UK cohorts, if not 40. So they're all linkable. Uh, I am unable to do so, to link them to the hospital records without 30 or 40 different research agreements. And I am unable full stop to link them to their GP records without going through a very tortuous de-identification, um, treble encryption process. Now, this effectively, it just makes the costs of doing this prohibitive, and it doesn't happen. So the UK operates in one of the richest health data environments in the world. The potential is enormous, but the bureaucracy is uh, extremely 
restrictive. So I do have an opinion. Yes. Good. Um, and, and, and I guess a comment that's related to this online is whether there is something about the way that the, the dementia is, is perceived by the healthcare services that will change. <coughs> so that, for example, it's <coughs> if it's seen as, a, as, a, as an illness rather than a social care issue, whether that will change the, the perception of how data should be shared. Uh, I, I think the, <coughs> the, the basic <coughs> data sharing culture uh, in the UK is, is one of, um, uh, we must not really allow this unless it is absolutely necessary uh, because the, 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 the possibility of legal recourse by individuals is substantially high. And so what happens is the decision to make the data available or not gets pushed higher and higher and higher and higher up the management scale. Uh, and people are reluctant to just make the decision. Um, the beauty of COVID was people were forced to make the decision, and guess what? It worked! And it worked without any prejudice to, to the security and the identity of the population of the UK. It was in complete benefit to the population. And the UK was one of the best places in the world to do COVID research. We could easily do that for dementia. Absolutely easily do that for dementia. We have another five minutes. Yeah, um, a couple of questions here in the room. <clears throat> yeah, my question is, who has the power to enforce that? The Secretary of State for Health. <laughs> Seriously. Another thing I'd like to make a comment, something what Liz said. Soon after I was diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's, one of the things I was recommended to do was social mobility. And I joined a choir, and it was so mind-blowing. <laughs> there are so many different things involved in s singing in a choir. Yeah, so that's, that's um, well known as sometimes singing is an island of retained function, and there's huge cognitive benefits for Sorry. some people with that. So it sounds great. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> singing and dancing is definitely what we recommend, because when you think of it, you know, there's the intellectual element, there's the movement element, uh, and there's, there's, the, uh, there's, there's the, uh, uh, the, the social element as well. One more question here. You say about data. What about the census that's filled in every 10 years for everybody who lives in the UK? Now, surely the census, it covers everything from lifestyle to income to health issues. If you play sport, you have to tick all these boxes. Can you use the data for that? Because I thought that was the whole idea of census form, that, you, that this information could be passed on to all the relevant departments. So that's number one. I've got to quickly say I agree with this lady here and the gentleman over there. Testing for dementia should be added to tests for colon, breast cancer, prostate. It's got to be added because if it can be picked up early, then who knows what, what the end of your life could be like if you are able to get one of the medications you spoke about. And thirdly, um, the importance of, of the dentist. Now, we all know on the news that there's a national shortage of NHS dentists, but I don't think, I, this is the first thing I've learned today, was about the dentist. I didn't realize periodontitis was, could, could be a link. So there's so much, to learn, but I think dentists should be, you know, informed of all this. So I thank you for today. I've learned such a lot, as you can see by all my notes. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, thank you. Okay, can I just address the census question? The census question, I think, is done by the Home Office. Um, the uh, uh, health hospital data is operated by the NHS. The um, where it trusts within the NHS even. Primary care data is offered by the, <coughs> the general practices. Uh, uh, educational data is uh, controlled by the Department for Education. Um, other social data are controlled by the Department for Justice. Um, all we want is these people to talk to each other and say, okay, this works, this system works. Why don't we use it for your system? Why don't you use it for your system? 
And that would transform all that we do. At, overnight, it would transform everything that we do. But until they are willing to allow and facilitate that linkage, um, life you know, is extremely frustrating because you know what could be achieved and yet here we are with, you know, I, I think outrageous reasons for not achieving it. I'm going to allow myself one more question before we close the event. Uh, it's coming from online, and it, it sort of picks up on that point um, around data sharing. Um, we will all be familiar that people have sensitivities around how their data is shared. So the question that Mark has online is whether people have the, whether they should be worried about how their data is shared and used. He's giving the example of this potentially leading to increased life insurance premiums. But what, what does the panel think about this, about you know the reasonableness of concerns about how data sharing occurs? Oh, let me go first, and then people can, people can correct me. Um, I, I think people should be very concerned um, uh, how the data are used, but they should also be aware of the many safeguards that exist and are in place. Uh, and they should also be aware of the many benefits that will occur uh, to these data being used. Uh, so, for example, the data that Sarah accesses on our data portal is de-identified. She has no idea uh, who, who they are. And here's the rub, or the point, that if she tried to find out, we would know, because we know everything she does on that computer. Um, I, I think the, uh, the benefits would, would just be uh, absolutely enormous. So yes, be concerned, but be concerned in an informed way that we do have really cast iron security arrangements to protect everyone. And when it comes, and that means that the information regarding insurance, et cetera, et cetera, is not available to insurance companies. And more to the point, the government uh, have an agreement with the insurance companies that these data would not be used, even if they were available. And it would be very easy for government to put in a, a, an act of parliament to make it law that these data should not be used by insurance companies. Any final comments? Liz? Well, I was just to say that if, if research data certainly can't be accessible, but I think in terms of early diagnosis... Uh, changes to life insurance, the needing to tell the DVLA, I think those are all things people have to take into account. In terms of life insurance, because um, diseases like Alzheimer's are unfortunately so common, I suppose at the moment we all pay an increased premium because so many people get it. If we get research and early diagnosis, fewer people will get it. As a, as a population, we'll be paying it sort of lower insurance in, in, per year anyway. Um, so uh, so uh, there'll be, there are huge benefits to knowing. But I think, I mean, people have to know about the, the possibility of these things for clinical testing, but for research, data is mm. uh, safe. They're, they're not accessible. Yeah. Um, and if I can close out this particular topic, uh, I think it's, it's very important also that we consider that these data that are collected on us really are our own personal data. And sometimes through, uh, through sort of an abundance of cautions, decisions are made about our data and, and, and whether they can be shared without really consulting us. And I, I think, you know, because I've been working with this in this field for you know five ten years i see a lot of goodwill and people realize that you know they've donated their time they've gone they've had a, an mri scanner mri scan with uk biobank or they've participated in studies or they simply go to their primary uh, care and, and and donate their data uh you know they want to see results out of this right they want to make sure that this data is it benefits not only them but uh you know if you like, humanity as a whole. And I think that's completely feasible. So I, I think certainly we as a public and, and, and we as professionals should should be arguing that this decision should be uh, put into the hands of the person who, whose data it is rather than, uh, rather than decisions being made about their data without their knowledge, given the potential that it has. Good. With that having said, uh, it's been a fantastic pleasure to have you all. Thank you very much for the, for the wonderful panel. Uh, thank you very much for, especially to, to Sarah for stepping in after we had two, two late cancellations. We had a, uh, a great talk from, from everybody. 
Uh, thank you very much for coming in in person and for, for giving us your afternoon. I hope you found this enjoyable. Thank you for everyone that uh, that dropped in online to, to listen in. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't get to absolutely all the questions that we had online, but uh, feel free to write to us at DPUK if there was anything that you want to you want to answer, and I'm sure that between us uh, we'll be able to master an answer. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.